Well, good morning and welcome to God's house. It's great to gather as his family of faith to sing his praises, to worship him, receive his gifts of grace and mercy. And as we do so, we celebrate the goodness of Jesus Christ, that he is your savior. He has come to redeem you and forgive you. And as First Peter tells us, we are able to bring all of our cares and cast them upon us upon him because he cares for us. And so that is what we get to do when we gather to worship. We get to empty all of our cares on Jesus, receive his gifts of grace and mercy. And so as we do that, I invite you to stand for our opening hymn, 493.
gather to worship this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This time we invited to kneel, sit, or stand for a time of silent reflection on God's word and for self-examination. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God in his mercy has given his Son, Jesus, to die for you. For his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. I invite you to stand for the reading of the Psalm of the day, which comes from Psalm chapter 98. We join together. O oh, sing to the Lord a new song, for he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have worked salvation for him. The Lord has made known his salvation. He has revealed his righteousness in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his steadfast love and faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre with the lyre and the sound of melody, with trumpets and the sound of the horn. Make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord, for he comes to judge the earth. He will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with equity. We join together in singing hymn number 484. God, the giver of all that is good, by your holy inspiration, grant that we may think those things that are right, and by your merciful guiding, accomplish them through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated.
The first reading this morning is from Job chapter 9, beginning at verse 1. Then Job answered and said, Truly, I know that it is so. But how can a man be in the right before God? If one wished to contend with him, one could not answer him once in a thousand times. He is wise in heart and mighty in strength who has hardened himself against him and succeeded. He who removes mountains and they are not when he overturns them in his anger, who shakes the earth out of its place and its pillars tremble, who commands the sun and it does not rise, who seals up the stars, who alone stretched out the heavens and trampled the waves of the sea. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle from this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction <clears throat> so that we may be able to comfort those who are are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea. But when his disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately, Jesus spoke to them, saying, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. So he said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshiped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise to you, O Christ. You may be seen as we join together in hymn number 722.
invite you to open a Bible to Matthew chapter 14, our gospel reading this morning, Matthew chapter 14, where Jesus walks on water and to prepare our hearts and minds to hear God's word this morning. We go to him in prayer. Our first prayer is for our own hearts and minds that the Holy Spirit would calm them, bring peace to them, and speak to us through God's holy word this morning. Our second prayer is for our brothers and sisters in Christ that the Holy Spirit would encourage and uplift their hearts and minds to the hearing of the gospel of Jesus. And finally, I ask that you pray for me that I would preach faithfully and truthfully the word of God for all to hear and proclaim boldly the gospel of Jesus Christ. Psalm 19 says, May the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. So we're in the middle of a sermon series because you all make fun of me, uh, and I, so I decided to turn it on you, where I always say, almost every week in Bible class or in church, this is one of my favorites. And you all laugh and go, well, isn't it all your favorite then? Uh, someone has said that to me so far. So <laughs> I decided to say, you know what? I'll just do a sermon series of some of my favorites. And we're going to look at some of my favorite stories. So last week, we looked at the story of Jesus calming the storm. This week, we're going to look at the story of Jesus and Peter walking on water, what we can learn about the gospel and being a disciple of Jesus from these stories. So three things that I see in this story of Jesus walking on water. First is that Jesus will make you go somewhere you don't always want to go. Jesus will make you do things that are uncomfortable. The second thing is that Jesus will give you and me grace when we fail. He will give us grace when we fail. And the third thing that we learn from this story is that Jesus is God over everything. Right, he's God over everything. So let's look at this story. Verse 22, it says, Immediately Jesus made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. Now the immediately is that right before this, in Matthew chapter 14, Jesus has just fed the 5,000, and the disciples helped a little bit, right? They found the Lunchable that, and the snacks that they were gonna use with the fish and the bread, and then Jesus did the miracle, and they passed them out, and they gathered the 12 basketfuls of loaves and said, we have more food than we could ever need. And so Jesus, right after this says, immediately made them get in the boat and leave. Now, if you were there for that moment, how many of you would not want to get in the boat and stay where the miracle had just happened with all the food? Right? How many of you like food? And Jesus made it. It's got to be good food, right? It's an awesome potluck. It's a miracle of God. Right? This is the greatest potluck ever. I would say, I don't want to get in the boat. I want to stay here with you, Jesus, where the miracle just happened. And yet Jesus tells his disciples, get in the boat and leave without me. Go to the other side. Now here's the reality. The other side is risky. Because the other side requires them to go to people they haven't gone to before. You see, the, the disciples had Jesus. He had come to them. He had called them. He had made them his disciples. He said, you come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. This beautiful invitation to change their lives. And they followed him, and they were worshiping him, and they were listening to his teaching. They were watching him do miracles. They just saw the feeding of the 5,000, one of the most famous miracles of all. And Jesus says, now I want you to go to the other side. That's risky. There's risk of the storms. There's the risk of shipwreck on the sea. But there's also the risk of going to people they haven't gone to before, the region of the Gerasenes, as Mark calls it a region of unclean pagans, people that they had been told their whole lives, don't go over there, right? Anybody have an area of town where you were told growing up, don't go over there? Or have people in your life where you wanted to hang out with them, your parents were like, don't hang out with them. They're bad for you. And you're like, well, now I want to hang out with them even more. At least that was what I did, right? But we have this attitude in us of, well, there's people that are good that we want to be with. We want to stay with the 5,000, right? We want to stay with Jesus where the miracle happened. But Jesus sometimes calls us to go and do the risky thing of going to the other side, of going to the people that we haven't gone to yet, 
Maybe we're nervous about it. We're afraid of that conversation. Maybe we're afraid of them. Maybe we don't understand their lifestyle, their choices. And Jesus is saying, I want you to go to the other side as my disciples because I want you to bring the gospel, the good news to them. Jesus is not just for you. The gospel is not just for you. It is for you, but not only you, right? Anybody know the song, Jesus Loves Me? All right. It's a great song. Love that song. It's one of the only songs I'll sing along to because I learned it as a kid. I know it. <laughs> and as great as it is, we sometimes think that's all the whole message is. Jesus loves me, right? That's always singing the song, Jesus loves me, right? But we forget what? Jesus loves them. Jesus loves everybody. Jesus loves those on the other side of the sea. And so Jesus tells his disciples, look, this feeding of the 5,000 was great. Being together with you guys is great, but I want you to go to the other side because I have people I want to reach over there as well. I'm not just going to stay with the 5,000. I've got other people I need to reach. In fact, Jesus will say in the Gospels, I have sheep that are not part of this flock, and I've got to go get them as well. And here's the scary part. You know how he goes and gets those other sheep? He sends his disciples, he sends you and me to the other side to go get the sheep and say, Jesus loves you too. Jesus is for you as well. Jesus' love and grace and forgiveness and redemption are for you. Um, last night we were at, some of us were at a Lutheran Bible Translators event and I got to speak there and then we got to see videos of all the mission work that they're doing. And one of the things that they showed us was a story in a country in Southeast Asia. They blurred all the faces, changed all the names to keep everybody safe. But they were sharing the story of how they, one of the language groups that they're working with has no written language at all. And you know how they're sharing the gospel? They're recording it in their language on MP3 players and SD cards and secretly sharing them around because it's illegal to share the gospel in their country. But they're taking the risk and saying, whatever it takes to get to the other side to reach more people, we're going to do that. And it's very inspiring to see. We go, okay, that's great. That's mission work over there. Well, the other side really wasn't that far away <laughs> for the disciples. It's not like they were crossing the Pacific Ocean, y'all. It's the Sea of Galilee. If you've got a Bible with maps in the back of it, look at it. It's a big lake. It's large, but it's not impossible to traverse. So the other side is not always the other side of the world. Sometimes it is. But sometimes the other side is just the other side of the street, the other side of the yard, the neighbor you can't stand. And Jesus is like, hey, how about you try loving them? And you're like, <laughs> have you met them, Lord? Don't tell me you don't have people like that in your life where the Lord's like, I want you to love them. The Holy Spirit's like, go love them, go love them, go love them. You're like, I don't think you've met them yet. And Jesus is like, but I want to. And the way they're going to meet me is through you. Because the gospel is not just limited for us. It is for the whole world. John 3, 16, right? He loved the whole world that he sent his son, Jesus, to die for us. And so Jesus is going to make you take risks sometimes. He's going to make you leave the comfort zone of the feeding of the 5,000, get in the boat, and go to the other side. And so this is what happens in verse 22. Immediately made the disciples get into the boat, go before him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. And after he dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat by this time was a long way from the land, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he came to them walking on the sea. Now here's the thing. Why would Jesus, who's Lord of everything, make them get into a boat when he knows crossing to the other side is not only risky, but he knows the storm is coming, right? Would you all agree that Jesus, who's Lord of everything, knows the storm is coming? And we just had last week a story of Jesus calming the storm. Now, here's the deal. In the first story of the Jesus calming the storm, not all 12 apostles were there yet. Matthew hadn't been called yet. He hadn't finished calling all 12 apostles. And so in the second time the storm happens, I think it's because he's trying to train his disciples to teach Matthew and the others that weren't there yet, it's going to be okay. 
Jesus has got this. Right? Because sometimes we get caught in the storms of life and we're overwhelmed with things. Anybody ever lash out at God, cry out to God and go, why, Lord, why me? Why is this happening? No? No, no one? Well, you guys got it good. All right. Well, anyway, at some point in your life, you might have an occasion to where you cry out to God, why? Why is this happening? And I think sometimes he wants you to be trained and experience it so that you can comfort and guide others to Jesus. To let them know Jesus has got this. To tell Jesus he's calmed the storm before. He can do it again. In fact, in our epistle reading in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, Paul writes, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our affliction, so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which, which we have received. So do you hear what Paul is saying here? He's saying God comforts you in your affliction, in all of your affliction. He's the God of all comfort. And then Paul doesn't say, just so you feel better. That's not how the verse goes. It's, he says, so that you and I can then therefore do what? Comfort others. Because the grace of God, the, the gospel of Jesus is not just for us. It is for all people. And one of the ways people experience God's love and God's comfort in their afflictions is through his church, through his people saying, Jesus has calmed the storms in my life. Let me walk you, with you through this. I know what it's like. C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite theologians and authors, and he talked about how the root of all friendships is the phrase, you too, with a question mark. Meaning, you like this painting too? You like this movie too? Or the flip side, you've been through that too? You've felt that kind of pain before too? So have I. And that's what friendship looks like with others to bring them into the love of Jesus. We help them say, oh, you too? You felt that before? What did you do in those moments? Well, I prayed. I was comforted by the God of all mercies and God of all comfort. Jesus calmed the storm in my life. So sometimes he has us risk so we can be like missionaries going to the other side. And sometimes he has us risk so we can learn what his comfort is like so we can share that comfort with others. The second thing that he's going to do is he's going to teach them that grace is for when they fail. So the waves are beating against them. The wind is against them. In verse 25, in the fourth watch of the night, Jesus came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, it is a ghost. That's a great reaction to Jesus, right? It's Jesus. No, it's a ghost. Let's just paddle harder. And they cried out in fear. They're terrified. Why? Because they're in the middle of the storm. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, take heart. It is I, do not be afraid. Don't you love how Jesus responds? He doesn't chastise them, he doesn't get angry with them, he doesn't tell them paddle harder, he doesn't say fix it out, fix it and figure it out on your own. What does he tell them? He says take heart, have courage, why? He says, because it's me, I'm here with you, you don't have to be afraid, right? The root of your courage and my courage, the root of us not being afraid and being obedient to that command in the Bible is not that you're awesome. I mean, you are awesome, I love you, okay? But that's not the root of your courage when we're going to the other side, when we're going through the storms that we're gonna comfort others through. The root of our courage is what? Jesus. He tells the disciples, take heart, why? Because it is I, I'm here with you in this. And then Peter answered him, and I love Peter, because he just, he just goes for it every time. Whether he's right or wrong, he goes for it. And I, I don't know if Peter really wanted to try walking on water, or if he knew what he was saying, but he's like, if Jesus can do it, right? Anybody ever had someone that go, is going through something, you just tell them, hey, whatever you need, let me know. And you kind of mean it, but you also don't mean anything, right? Anybody know what I'm talking about? <laughs> you're like, and then they just go, okay, let me have your house. And you're like, well, I mean, 
I was going to make you a sandwich. <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about? So I think Peter's kind of in the boat like, he's not really going to tell me to get out of the boat. Right? Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said one word. <laughs> Just come. I'm like, all right. Now, if you were Peter, how many of you have been like, oh, oh you, you're serious right now. But Peter got out of the boat. And not just that Peter got out of the boat, what did Peter also do? He walked on the water and came to Jesus. And this is like the highlight of Peter's life. How many of you have walked on water? Right? Here's another way of asking it. How many of you, when you told Jesus to tell you to get out of the boat, to be brave, to go to the other side, actually got out of the boat? None of the other apostles got out of the boat. See, I don't think it's just that Peter walked on water that's so amazing. I think it's that he was willing to get out of the dang boat in the middle of that storm. No one else was. And so it's this highlight of his life, and it's this great miracle. And then what happens, though, like so many of us, when Peter saw the wind in verse 30, he was what? He was afraid, and he began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Anybody ever experienced the highs and lows of life? and how rapidly they follow each other sometimes. How many of you have been like, I love Jesus and I will get out of the boat at one point in your life? Show of hands. He's like, let's do it, Lord. Let's go to the other side. I'm with you. I'm going to walk on water. And then how many of you, like the next day or week, were immediately like, Lord, save me? Because I'm drowning. Why? Because Peter saw the wind and the waves and was like, I'm not supposed to be walking on water. This is not normal. This is not for humans to do. And what does Jesus do? In verse 31, he shows grace again. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and took hold of him. He doesn't let Peter drown. He doesn't let Peter sink. He doesn't let Peter fumble around and try to swim and figure it out all on his own. He immediately reaches out and grabs him and saves him. That's the beauty of God's grace for you and me. There will be times where you and I feel brave enough to get out of the darn boat and walk on water with Jesus and say, I'm going to go to the other side. It's going to be awesome when you do. There's going to be other times, though, when you try and you fail. And you're going to cry out, Lord, save me. And the good news of Jesus is he reaches his hand out immediately and saves Peter. And he saves you. There's no requirement. He doesn't, like, ask Peter, like, well, are you going to try again if I pick you up? He doesn't, he doesn't make fun of Peter of, like, what's wrong with you? He doesn't judge Peter. He just immediately reaches his hand out and saves him by his grace. And which is, leads to this question. He reaches out and he took hold of him, saying to him, Oh, you little faith, why did you doubt? See, sometimes you can read that question and be like, Man, Jesus is mean. But I don't think he's being mean here. I think he's being comforting. He's like, Why did you doubt? Why did you doubt? Why did your faith fail? You were doing it, Peter. You were walking on water with me, right? Where is Peter's doubt? Peter's doubt is, I'm not really supposed to be doing this. And Jesus is trying to teach him, yes, you are, because you're my disciple. And if I'm doing it, you, you, you can do it. I'm going to be with you the whole way. And so Jesus is asking this question to try to encourage Peter to get up again and keep getting out of the boat. So he gives us grace. And the third thing that he shows us is that he is God over everything. Verse 32 says this, and when they, Peter and Jesus, got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshiped Jesus, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Now, why do that? When Jesus just fed the 5,000, how many of you think the feeding of the 5,000 is a pretty great miracle? You know what they didn't do after that? Worship him and say, you are the Son of God. All right, our Old Testament reading, Job chapter um, 9, <clears throat> says this, who alone stretched out the heavens and walked on the waves of the sea. 
When Job is saying that, he's describing God, and he's saying, you alone are the one that can walk on water. So when Jesus walks on water and calms the storm, he's showing to his disciples, that is about me. I'm God. I'm not just a miracle worker. I'm not just here to fill up your bellies with feeding the 5,000. I'm here to show you that I am the God over everything, over the storm, over you, over your whole life. And there is great comfort when we bow down and worship Jesus as God and stop worshiping ourselves. How many of you enjoy worshiping yourself? Let's all just confess in church that we're guilty of it. And here's my evidence. How many of you have a calendar? Anybody got a calendar? Anybody got one of these that rules your life, runs everything, right? Your email and your calendar is there, and it's, it's doing what? It's trying to make sure you've got control over every area of your life. Now, I'm not saying having a calendar is sinful. Don't, like, go tell your boss, my pastor told me not to have a calendar or email. Right? You, I don't want you to get fired, okay? <laughs> but there is something to it, right? Where we let it rule over our lives, we're trying to control every area of our lives. We worry about it. We get frantic about it. We're, how many of you are concerned about the future sometimes and how uneven it is and how uncertain it is because you don't know it yet? Here's the invitation. Jesus says, I'm the God who can walk on water. No one else can. I'm the one that tramples the seas. I'm the one that controls the wind and the waves. I'm the one that calms the storms. I'm the one that's God over every area of creation, including your life. And dear brothers and sisters, there's great comfort when we join the disciples and bowing down and saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Worshiping him, saying, you're the only God. It's not me anymore. Because how many of you have tried to calm the storms in your life and you were unable to? How many of you, like Peter, you're like, I'm going to walk on water. I'm getting across the other side one way or the other. And then you were drowning and crying out, Lord, save me at one point. And here's the great comfort that Jesus says is, I am the Lord over everything. There's not an area of your life he's not in control of, ruling and reigning over. There's not an area of your life that Paul says he can't comfort you in or give you mercy in. Because he is the God of all comfort and the God of all mercies. So my request to you, my challenge to you, my hope and prayer for you is that you would join the disciples in worshiping Jesus as the only God. That you would stop worshiping yourself and you say, I'm going to bow down and praise him as the God who is Lord over everything. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we give thanks that you are the God who walks on water, who calms the storms in our lives and gives grace to us when we fail. Lord, may we follow the Holy Spirit and his prompting and his guiding in our lives when he says, I want you to go to the other side. And when you say, get out of the boat, may we, like Peter, follow his example of getting out of the boat, trusting in your grace to lift us up every time we fail and come up short. And may we worship you as the only true God in our lives. In your name we pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we confess our Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. We confess together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We go to our God in prayer. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, you invite us freely to come and hear your word. Bless and increase our faith that we may rightly fear you and learn what you have done for our souls. Lord, in your mercy. Lord of all, you make known the good news of peace through our Savior, Jesus Christ. 
Bless and direct the work of our missionaries that in every nation there would be people who fear God, do what is right, and believing in Jesus receive forgiveness of sins through his name. Lord, in your mercy. Father of love, out of great love for you and for sinners, our Lord Jesus laid down his life for the world. Increase in us true love for one another, that like our Lord, we may also lay down our lives for our friends. Lord, in your mercy. Lord God, the giver of all that is good, grant your healing and support to all who are in sorrow or need, sickness or adversity. Give them also the gift of your grace to accept and bear their crosses with faith in you, that finally they would be prepared to depart this life and receive the gift of eternal life in your kingdom. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, Heavenly Father, we gratefully remember the sufferings and death of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, for our salvation. Rejoicing in his victorious resurrection from the dead, we draw strength from his ascension before you, where he ever stands for us as our own high priest. Gather us together from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. For to you alone we give all glory, honor, and worship. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated as we continue our worship by presenting our tithes and offerings. Please stand as we join together in singing hymn number 805. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times and all places give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God. And most especially are we bound to praise you on this day for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, the very Paschal Lamb, who has sacrificed for us and bore the sins of the world. By his dying, he has destroyed death, 
and by his rising again, he has restored to us everlasting life. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter and John, with all the witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, Blessed are you, Lord of heaven and earth, for you have had mercy on those whom you created and sent your only begotten Son into our flesh to bear our sin and be our Savior. With repentant joy, we receive the salvation accomplished for us by the all-availing sacrifice of his body and his blood on the cross. Gathered in the name and the remembrance of Jesus, we beg you, O Lord, to forgive, renew, and strengthen us with your word and spirit. Grant us faithfully to eat his body and drink his blood as he bids us do in his own testament. Gather us together, we pray, from the ends of the earth to celebrate with all the faithful the marriage feast of the Lamb in his kingdom, which has no end. Graciously receive our prayers, deliver and preserve us. To you alone, O Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. When he gave it thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to him, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup was the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please stand for the communion blessing. May this true body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve your faith to life everlasting. Go in his peace. Amen. We join together in singing Thank the Lord. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this sanitary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us with the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Uh, before the benediction, there are several announcements of activities and ministries happening in the Happenings insert, but one to draw your attention to is that Teresa Rupert, our Director of Music, will be resigning. Um, from our Savior and her position at the end of May with her contract comes up. And so we want to spend the month thanking her for all of her years of service and all of the music and praise that she's brought into our church. And on um, her last Sunday will be May 26th. So following the service, we'll have a special reception and celebration to honor her and thank her for all the service of, to God that she's given to this church and to our church and our family here. So thank you, Teresa, for everything you've done. So we can give her a round of applause. As you go today, go with the blessing and the peace of the Lord. The Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Lord, look upon you with favor and give you his peace. Amen.